gangsters. How you guys doing today? Uh, welcome to the Answers with Joe live stream. I'm your host, Joe Scott. And today, <laughs> can't pull off that voice very long. Uh, now today I got a few things to cover. Actually, I, I had to kind of narrow down all that I wanted to talk about today because I found a lot of cool stuff. So um, I've got three stories like I always do, and then I got a bonus. You get a bonus. Okay. Um, so let's just jump in because there's a lot of stuff to cover and I want to leave some time for a Q&A. First of all, thank you guys for joining. It's Wednesday. Hope you're having a great one. Hope you're having a good week all together. Um, I do want to let you know I am having some streaming issues or is showing some streaming issues. I'm hoping that it does not uh, affect you guys too much. Let me know if it does in the comments. I don't know if there's much I can do about it from my end right now. So anyway, I'm just letting you know that might be an issue. I'm, I'm hoping not, but you guys let me know. Anyway, um, so let's get into it. The first story, as you saw in the title, is um, a story about time crystals. This, this combines a couple of different stories that I've talked about in various times on the channel. I've talked about time crystals. I've talked about quantum computers, both of which very exciting and interesting. Um, all right, I'm seeing that it's uh, it's buffering for you guys on your end. I'm keeping an eye on it. Hopefully it gets a little better. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so the time crystals thing. Now, time crystals, incredibly complex and, and complicated thing to talk about. Uh, quantum computers, incredibly complex and complicated thing to talk about. So let's combine those two and try to sum it all up live in a couple of minutes. Good luck with that. But. Um, the link to this obviously is down in the, uh, in the description below, so I'd, I invite you to go check it out. There's links off of that to pursue, pursue it even further. But uh, the basic gist is, you know, as we know with quantum stuff, uh, there's that sort of observer effect that you can't really observe it and get an accurate description of where things are and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's a problem in a quantum computing system because you need to be able to get accurate results. And that's, all, that's like one of the biggest headaches with quantum computers that they're having is you have these qubits that sort of come in and out of their wave states as you try to measure them. And uh, that becomes a problem. So um, on the other hand, you have time crystals, which again, <laughs> starting to hate myself for even trying to cover this here. It's super complicated. Um, you know, crystals are basically atoms that arrange themselves in certain positions in space. And they describe time crystals as uh, atomic structures where they arrange themselves in space, but also in time. And what this basically means is that it's sort of a natural system in which these atoms try to arrange themselves in a coherent way. You're going to hear the word coherence quite a bit here. So the idea is, according to this article, that if these atoms can arrange themselves in this coherent state and maintain a coherent state, a stable coherent state, in a time crystal format, then it might make them easier to measure in a quantum computing system. So there's this so, sort of idea going around right now where like, we, you know, t time crystals were just theorized in 2012. And they were kind of proven to be true last year. I covered it here in a video. And since then, there's been a lot more, um, uh, a lot more research into it. So it's been replicated. So it's, it's looking pretty good. But anyway, the idea is if we can manufacture these time crystals and employ them as uh, quantum circuits and use them as qubits, it would stabilize it, make quantum computing quite a bit easier. And the whole quantum supremacy thing could be a little bit closer than we thought. Um, it might be one of those little leapfrogging technologies and ideas that could make the whole thing um, more possible than, than we thought it would be, and it might be happening sooner than we thought. So that's really cool stuff, in my opinion. Um, obviously, again, the uh, it's still still buffering. Sorry, guys. I don't know what to say. Um, but anyway, so um, that that's that's interesting. Definitely worth a read. Links downstairs. Go and check that out. Fun stuff. All right, so this next one is about a new rocket engine. And this one kind of blows my mind, uh, more than kind of, actually. So some of this I'm going to have to just read from the article. So there's uh, a team working from the University of Glasgow in uh, cooperation with a team from the university, a university in Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. But they have fired and throttled up and managed and worked and produced something called an autophage engine. 
And the reason this is weird, and the reason this is crazy, is because the autophage engine, what it basically does is it eats itself. You heard that right. So what it's basically arguing here is you, you have this, this uh, the tyranny of the rocket equation, as they call it. So you, know, you, you need fuel to get into space, and you need more fuel to get further up into space. But the more fuel you add, it adds weight, and that makes it uh, require more fuel, right? So real quick, Primus 81, thank you for the tip, sir. That was very nice. Thank you. Um, so what they're trying to get around here is basically if you, if you get um, rid of the tanks and the propellant in a way that um, basically just kind of destroys itself on the way up, then by the time you get into space, there's a couple of things. One, you have less weight that you have to deal with, so it kind of helps out with that whole rocket equation. But two, there's less space debris. Because now when we get up into space, we still have tanks, we still have uh, other stages and whatnot that has to fall back to Earth or it has to deorbit or something, or else it winds up becoming space junk, and that's going to be a major problem if we don't do something about that. So, um, long story short, uh, what this thing is supposed to do interestingly, is it supposed to, it, it's, a, it's a solid rocket booster that has an oxidizer inside of it. So apparently like the hull of the rocket is the solid rocket booster. And so as it goes up, it just kind of devours itself until you get to the top. And then by the time you get up into space, all that's left is that, you know, payload or the second stage. And one of the advantages of this is they're saying that you could scale it so that um, for very small satellites or very large satellites, you could make it bigger and smaller, and it would get you there um, with, with less waste and less uh, expense. That's super interesting, and it's something they're just now starting with. Um, I, I'm getting a little, just a little tangent here, but I'm, I'm a little bit wary, or I don't get too excited about new rocket designs because uh, there's a lot of new rocket designs that have come and gone out there, but um, but they don't always get implemented very quickly. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, if you have a commercial partner that is paying you to get your payload into space, they don't really want to experiment, <laughs> you know, and especially so if there are people on board. So um, that's why, you know, we tend to kind of gravitate toward what we know works. That's kind of why Russian technology has been so uh, pervasive in, in the rocket industry because it's tried and true and everybody trusts it. Um, so you kind of need these, um, I, I would argue that that's kind of a reason why you want NASA and you want uh, a big government agency to kind of do things just for the purpose of research because a commercial venture, it's going to be really hard for SpaceX to like try a brand new type of rocket engine uh, or, or rocket labs or any of these guys. Um, but we'll see. Anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting idea. Not sure how practical it is, but it's, it's an interesting idea, and I just thought I would share that with you guys. Links downstairs. Uh, moving on. We're talking about autonomous cars. Um, actually, autonomous self-driving technology is a lot more than just cars. So this is from Ars Technica. By the way, the last one was from fizz.org. The one before that was from the next web. Uh, those are the places I'm getting these uh, these articles from. Anyway, so this one from Mars Technica is talking about a couple of new uh, startups out there that are working on autonomous vehicles that um, don't carry people. They're basically um, they, they like one of them delivers groceries, as you can see in this picture. This one's called Neuro. It said a small it's a small electronic vehicle for hauling cargo. Uh, it's designed to be street legal, but has no room for passengers. So, um, Neuro, the idea is that um, basically you would have a small area, a part of town that maybe is like self-contained, a little, um, what do they call them, like an apartment village or something like that. Um, and what this car would do is, you know, instead of calling up and like if you have to get groceries, instead of going to the grocery store, you could just call in or get, the, get it online or on an app and the grocery people would bag it up, put it in this car, and it just drives out to where you are, and you go out and get it. It's kind of like UPS or, or even Amazon, except uh, instead of having to wait days, it's a few minutes, it comes to your door. Um, so that's what's going on with Nero. I'm gonna kind of scroll down here a little bit. Um, there is another one called Drive.ai, 
And the reason this is interesting to me is because they're going to start this autonomous shuttle service here in Dallas. So Neuro is not for people. Drive.ai is for people. And they kind of hail themselves as something like a straddle between buses and taxis. So it's like a bus because it's a shared service. But, um, and, and it's in a fixed area, so they have certain stops that you go to. But it's a, instead of being on a fixed route and schedule, it's something that you hail. So you would like go to the, I guess, drive.ai stop or bus stop or whatever, whatever locations they have around. And you hop on your app and say, pick me up. And it sends one around. So it's not like on this constant loop going around, even if there's nobody on it. It comes and picks you up as you're needed or as it's needed. Um, and they're going to be doing this, if you're familiar with the Dallas area, they're going to be starting it up in, uh, in Frisco, which is not surprising. Everything starts in Frisco these days. Uh, Frisco is a, a suburb of Dallas that's like, I, I, I think two years ago it was the fastest growing city in the country, something like that. It's just it's exploding by leaps and bounds, so um, it's not really all that surprising. But that's what one of them looks like right there. That's the drive.ai bus. And... Um, and it's, so this is really more like a self-driving car that goes around and picks people up. The Neuro is more of a specialized uh, cargo type thing. But um, let me see. I think it says where the uh, the North Platinum Corridor, a commercial area in Dallas, suburb of Frisco, uh, cluster of office buildings surrounded by big parking lots, uh, new development called Frisco Station. So yeah, I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but Dallas is like huge on these big. Um, developments where it's like apartments and office buildings and restaurants and stores and everything retail all like encompassed into one short or small area and I think I think this is a good service for that and I think it's also um, I think that's where we're gonna first start to see real level 5 autonomous cars happening actually I think that would be considered level 4 because um, you could, and I like the idea of this. You have this enclosed area where it's kind of understood <laughs> that there's autonomous cars driving around here. I think Phoenix is, is doing this right now, as a matter of fact, with Waymo. And so the, the people there kind of understand okay, well, there's going to be these autonomous cars driving around. And also, it's mostly on streets, so, you know, side streets and stuff like that. It's not going to be going really fast. So it's a lot more uh, regimented and easier to kind of work out all the kinks in the system and stuff like that. And there will be kinks. But um, it's very kinky, these electronic, these autonomous cars. Um, but this is a great place to start. It's a great place to kind of work out the technology. And then when you get to level five, that's where you just sit in a car and there's not even a steering wheel. And you just tell it where to take you and it'll take you anywhere that you want to go on any street in any place. Um, so it's funny because we've been having some, you know, we've been hearing a lot about <laughs> autopilot issues with Tesla and people misusing it or not and it's it's we're, I mean, there was another wreck today that um, that I heard about so it, it's been a little frustrating actually recently because it seems like there's been almost a backpedaling in the autonomous area but then there are things like this that seem to be pushing things forward a little bit one thing that it did say about Nero that I thought was interesting is that um, because it's not made to even hold humans it's it's a completely different layout like uh, it's a lot lighter. It was it was actually talking in there, and this is worth a read, by the way. Go go check this out in the in the description. But it was saying that um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, you don't really think about how much a car is centered around keeping a human alive, <laughs> basically. And uh, so they uh, they talk about how these neuro cars, because they don't have to have humans in them, they're a lot lighter, they're a lot cheaper, they're a lot more efficient. And um, and obviously there's there's fewer safety concerns when having these things drive around because there's not a person in it and it doesn't have to go at any particular speed or anything either. So anyway, it's 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 cool to me. So um, let me check in with the live stream. I'm seeing a lot of buffer comments. Is it still happening? Yeah, I'm sorry guys. I don't I don't know I don't know what to do about the buffering. I was you're telling me to stop. Because it's buffer central, is what I'm saying. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, hopefully, this will not happen next time. Tell you what, let me just get through this last little story, and then I'll wrap it up. I'm, I don't know. Um, I don't know how to fix this while while the car is moving. But speaking of cars, um, you know, I talked on Monday about the Model Three update um, here on. Uh, 
a, a story that I didn't cover on there, but uh, Consumer Reports kind of withdrew. It didn't withdrew, but they kind of held back their recommendation because of braking issues. They found that it broke. The braking, uh, it stopped like 20 feet further than it was supposed to or something. And um, because of this, Elon and put his team at Tesla on the whole thing, and, um, and they fixed the problem with an over-the-air update. And uh, CR, Consumer Reports, decided to go ahead and give them the recommendation afterwards. So this is kind of a big deal uh, to get their, their big recommendation from Consumer Reports. But it's also, they say in this article, one of the, the people in here, it says, I've been at CR for 19 years and tested more than 1,000 cars, and I've never seen a car that could improve its track performance with an over-the-air update. So again, it's, it's one of these great benefits to the Model 3 platform and, and what they're trying to do is that they can actually take uh, take criticisms from drivers and problems and they can fix it over the air and it's that's that's a really cool thing um, so anyway I am still getting a bunch of buffering uh, comments here so people are asking me to de decrease the stream res I can't I can't do that while I'm in the middle of it I have to stop it and start over but all right I guess I'll go ahead and wrap this up then because I, I don't want you guys to be, I mean, I, I can see how annoying this is. I can see it myself. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mako, for, <laughs> for the tip there. You're tipping me for like the worst live stream ever. Um, but thank you for that. I don't know. Tell you what, guys, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm, I'm sorry this was buffering so bad and I don't know. I don't know what the problem is here. I'll have to, I may have to re restart my router or something. Um, yeah, so sorry guys, this was a little bit of a bust because of the the buffering issue. Hopefully it won't be a problem next time. I, I saw that it was buffering a little bit before I started, but I thought maybe it would smooth itself out. Sometimes it does. Didn't look like it was trying didn't didn't look like it did that here. And plus I'm so flustered over the buffering and, and the comments I'm getting about it, I'm having trouble talking. So yeah. Um uh, alright, well, I'll I'll cut this short then and um <laughs> I hope you got at least something out of that, and uh, I'll uh, I'll catch you guys next time. I should have another video coming out tomorrow, and obviously one on Monday. So um, I'll catch you guys then. Later. <laughs>